بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جاءته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت الأليم الحكيم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وعنم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أسأل الله تبارك وتعالى أن يجعل نياتنا خالصة لوجه الكريم I praise Allah I thank Allah تبارك وتعالى I ask Allah to raise the rank and the status and the honor and the esteem of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his family, his companions and all of those who follow them in excellence until the day of judgment. Inshallah, I ask all of you to share the video now. Make the intention, inshallah, to spread beneficial knowledge and share the button, inshallah. I wanted to get into a habit of, you know, everyone engaging in da'wah so that we all share in the reward of what we're doing. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, the one who indicates to guidance, what means the one who indicates to guidance or that which is good, will have the reward of the one who does it. The one who indicates to goodness, gets the reward of the one who's actually doing it. So you just press share, make the noble intention, and you get the reward of everything that we're doing. May Allah increase our rewards. We need them. On Yawm Al-Qiyamah, we talked about Al-Mizan, the scale of deeds. There's going to be hasanat and sayyat, good deeds and bad deeds. Let's fill our scales with hasanat and remove as sayyat fill them up with good deeds and remove the bad deeds. So inshallah, we all be winners on the day of the judgment. The day when money and children will be of no benefit. Only the one who comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a pure heart. May Allah give us pure hearts. Ameen. So yesterday, we left off talking about مَا يَجِبُ لِلَّهِ تَعَالَى مِنَ الصِّفَاتِ What is obligatory to attribute to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala among the attributes? And we talked about the statement of the uh, uh, author he said, مَا يَجِبُ لِلَّهِ تَعَالَى وَيَجِبُ عَلَيْنَا مَعْرِفَتَهُ What is obligatory to attribute to Allah and what is obligatory upon us to know in relation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he mentioned some attributes, sifatul wujud, the attribute of existence. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran about that Afillahi Shak in Surah Ibrahim. Allah mentioned, is there any doubt? Meaning there is no doubt. It's negating. Uh, there is no doubt about the existence of Allah. And Allah said, kuntum. And he is with you wherever you may be. Meaning with his knowledge, meaning Allah exists. And we talked about the attribute of Al-Wahdaniyah. 
oneness, which Allah wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran. He said, Wa ilahukum ilahun wahid. And Allah mentioned in the Quran, Kul huwa Allahu ahad. So you'll see where these attributes are mentioned either explicitly or implicitly in the Quran, in the Hadith. So that's why it's obligatory to know them, right? And we talked about Sifatul Azaliya, meaning Al Qidam. And Allah mentioned in the Quran, Huwa al Awwal, He is the first. And was Sifatul Baqa, and the attribute of everlastingness. As Allah said, Kullu man alayha fan wa yabqa wajhu rabbuka, rabbika dhul jalali wal ikram. That everything on the earth will perish. And the self of Allah will remain. So this is Al-Baqa. And then we end up with the attribute Al-Mukhalifatu lil Hawadith, which means that Allah does not resemble his creation. And Allah mentioned in the Quran, Laysa ka mithlihi shay'un wa huwa al basir. So inshallah, we're going to go uh, to read on page number eight in our book, Ladder, The Ladder to Success in Truly Loving Allah wa ta'ala. Uh, inshallah, we'll read on page eight. Naam, begin. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam wa la rasulullah. The oh, author, oh, oh. may Allah ta'ala have mercy on him, said, number six, Absolute self-subsistence. Number seven, ability. So absolute self-subsistence, which is known as al-qiyamu bin nafs. Al-qiyamu bin nafs. Meaning that Allah wa ta'ala is not in need of anything. And in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, we are all in need, impoverished, fuqara, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah is the one who is free of need and worthy of praise. And Allah so also mentioned in Surah Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Wallahu al-ghaniyu wa antum al That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free of any need and all of us are impoverished before Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. We're all in need of Allah. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَنِيٌّ عَنِ الْعَالَمِينَ Verily Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala is free of need of all of the creation. Now, Number seven, ability. Al-Qudra, وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Excuse me, Allah mentioned in the Qur'an, وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ That Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala has the power and the ability over everything. And Al-Qudra, it is that attribute by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings all of the intellectual permissibilities, those things that are jaizul wujud, that are permissible to exist, and that's all of the creation, by his attribute of al-Qudra, he brings things into existence and takes them out of existence. So the power of Allah wa ta'ala only relates to the intellectual permissibilities. It does not relate to the intellectual necessity, which is Allah and his attributes, or the intellectual impossibility like a partner for Allah. Now, Number eight, will. Al-irada, which is will, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, fa'alun lima yurid, and that's al-irada, will. Another name for the will is al-mashiyah, as Allah mentioned, 
وما تشاءون الا ان يشاء الله رب العالمين you will not will anything except that allah tabarak wa ta'ala is wills willed it here when we say the will of allah it is that attribute by which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifies those intellectual permissibilities with one attribute that is befitting for them over another mm now number 9 knowledge allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention about sifatul ilm the attribute of knowledge allah said wa anna allah qad ahata bi kulli shay'in ilma that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his knowledge encompasses everything encompasses everything and allah mentioned ala ya'lamu man khalaq wa huwa al-latif al-khabir does allah not know what he created allah tabarak wa ta'ala is the gentle the subtle the aware now number 10 hearing without ears and allah is attributed with as-sam' and as-sam' hearing is not with limbs and organs like ears allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said wa huwa as-sami'u al-basir he is the one who is attributed with hearing and sight number 11 sight without eyes al-basar as we mentioned sight and allah is not attributed with organs or limbs like eyes and he said wa huwa as-sami'u al-basir as well al-basir and as-sami' names of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala naam number 12 life without a spirit allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is attributed with an eternal and everlasting life that does not consist of flesh or bones or a soul so here when we say al haya life for allah we must understand that allah is not a spirit allah is not the holy spirit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he is the one who created the souls and the spirit he is not a spirit so we don't call Allah a soul a living soul or a living spirit la huwa alladhi khalaq al-arwah he is the one who created the souls naam and Allah said about himself Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum he is al-hayy the one who is alive mm. number 13 speech without letters sounds and language al kalam the speech of allah lay is laysa harfan wala sawtan wala lughatan that the speech of allah is not letters or sounds or a language meaning the eternal speech which is an attribute of himself subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah confirmed the attribute of speech to himself when Allah said subhanahu wa ta'ala wa kallama Allah Musa taklima that Allah tabarak wa ta'ala spoke directly to Musa mm. now note the divine attributes do not change they did not happen rather they are attributes of Allah ta'ala without beginning since the attributes of the beginningless are beginningless there is no okay, so He gives us something to be aware of. He said was sifatul ulahiyati la tatagayyaru fa laysat tariatan bal hiya sifatun lillah bil ibtida lianna sifat al azaliyi la takunu illa azaliyatan which is an important rule. Whenever we talk about the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which are divine attributes attributes of godhood right they don't change they don't occur they don't happen why because the attributes of allah are qadima are without a beginning they don't have a beginning just like the self of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have a beginning so since allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is without a beginning then his attributes are without a beginning because a created attribute is 
a sign of the thing that it is attributed with is also created. Whenever you have a created attribute, that is an indication that the thing that is attributed with that is also created. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-qadim al-azali. He is uh, the one who has no beginning to his existence. Now, there is no resemblance between the attributes of Allah Ta'ala and the attributes of creatures with the same names. Though the linguistic meanings of the attributes of created entities given their names do make it easier for our intellect to understand whatever it is capable of understanding of those attributes. Right Allah here. So whenever we talked about the difference between Al-Asma, right, and Al-Ma'ani, Names and the meanings that relate to those names. Or we can say in another way, al-alfaz, words and ma'ani. We talked about this. So you don't have no similar to, no resemblance between the attributes of Allah and other attributes of creations that have the same names of the attributes of Allah. Methanan, as an example, we say about the human that the human sees, we say about Allah, as we mentioned, that Allah is attributed with sifatul sam'i, with the attribute of uh, sifatul basari, the attribute of seeing, right? So we say that the human sees and Allah sees. So the word al-basar is mentioned both for the attribute of the human being and the attribute of Allah. So it's named al-basar. As for the meaning that relates to that, it is different. The human, in order to see, needs an eye, needs a pupil, needs light, needs distance. It's a created scene. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his scene is without any of those, and we cannot describe or give limits to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees. So even though the word is saying the same, and the name that is used for to describe the attribute is same, but there is complete non-resemblance in the meaning between Allah and his creation. Now, while bearing in mind that between the attributes of creatures and the attributes of the true Allah Ta'ala, there is no commonality to begin with or resemblance at all. So meanings of words only bring things to our mind to the, our limited capacity. But when we're talking about Allah, Allah's reality is beyond our capacity to understand, right? So we only know what Allah mentioned to us about it in terms of names and attributes. But as for the reality of those names and attributes, we don't know that. Mm. So whatever you imagine in your mind, Allah is different from that. Is this meaning clear? where you distinguish between Allah and his creation? Is this completely clear? Because I think if you got this, you're, you're like almost 90, 80, 90% towards understanding all these differences when you understand this point. Allah. Tell you. Okay. The rational mind's judgment of these aforementioned attributes being necessary for Allah Ta'ala Most High means that the rational mind does not accept and does not conceive of Allah Ta'ala being described with their opposites, i.e. Yeah. Right, so here when we say wa hukmul aqli, right, the judgment of the mind, right? So we're talking about the sound mind. And as our teachers used to say, the sound mind has a consideration in the sacred law. We're not people who don't use our minds. The sound mind has its place in the sacred law right? You have to think. You have to use your mind. It has a, 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 an importance in the sacred law. And the judgment of the mind is that 
these attributes mentioned are necessary to attribute to Allah. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could not be attribute, the sound mind does not accept that Allah would be attributed with the opposites of those attributes. So if Allah is attributed with al-wujud, he's mawjud, we cannot attribute to Allah al-adam, non-existence, right? If Allah is attributed with al-wahdaniyya, we cannot attribute him a ta'addud by right? having multiplicity, right? If Allah is attributed with al-azaliyya, al-qidam, he cannot be attributed with al-huduth, with being a created thing. If he is attributed with al-baqa, he cannot be attributed with al-fana, like that. The opposite is impossible to attribute Allah. Why? Because Allah munazzahun an kulli naqsin fi haqqihi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clear of any deficiency that could be attributed to him, any non-befitting attribute. So the opposite of these obligatory attributes would entail deficiency to attribute to the creator subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, i.e. the rational mind also judges the attributes of deficiency which are opposite to them and are inconsistent with Allah Ta'ala Most High to be impossible. Right. And to be impossible to attribute to him. Now. And it, the rational mind, negates them from him with certainty. And here, so when we talk about uh, certain things with people ascribe to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, it's not befitting. So to say Allah mausufun bil julus, as an example, that Allah is attributed with sitting, this would entail negating, it, it, it is naqs, it is deficiency, and it would negate attributes that are obligatory to attribute to Allah. So you say Allah sits, that which sits has an upper and a lower part, that means it's a body, that which is in body, is composed of jawahir, of par uh, particles and arad and uh, attributes of particles. And that which is like that is created. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not created. Hence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the, meaning Allah has the attributes of al-mukhalifatu lil hawadith al-qiyamu bin nafs. So Allah cannot be in need Allah cannot resemble his creation, so Allah cannot be attributed with sitting. Because in order to sit, you have to be in need. You're in need of an upper and a lower part that bends. That's to sit. That's the attribute of sitting. So you're in need. You're also composed of parts. That is, you need one part to be in that whole, to be a body. You need uh, attributes of the body. You need particles that make up the body. So it's in need. And Allah is attributed with al qiyamu bin nafs, free of need. Therefore, that cannot be attributed to Allah because all of those are attributes of deficiency. Like sitting, like settling, like being in a location, and other than that, Nam. Similarly, transmitted knowledge proves that they are negated from him most high. So right here, and then he mentions, so he's saying, right, Al-Aqal yanfiha yani al naqais right? Deficient attributes, right? Qat an anhu ta'ala. Absolutely, any deficiency is negated by al-aql, by the man. He said, wa kathalika al-naqlu yadullu ala intifa'iha anhu ta'ala. Likewise, whenever you're going to talk about from the transmitted text of the Quran and Ta'ala, uh, the Quran and the Sunnah, they, they indicate that these non-befitting attributes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clear of them, they are negated by Allah. So both al-aql and al-naql, both the sound mind and the transmitted text of the Quran and Sunnah negate any attribute of imperfection about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hence, one has to know those to negate uh, non-befitting attributes to Allah. So the author, uh, Rahimahullah, or Hafizahullah Ta'ala, this is the commentator, he's going to mention 
what is impossible uh, what is impossible to attribute to Allah since he mentioned what is obligatory and the sound mind and the transmitted text negate the opposite he's going to give you the opposite of those obligatory attributes by way of clarifying Go ahead. What is impossible for Allah Ta'ala? So what is impossible for Allah, meaning what is impossible to attribute to Allah wa Ta'ala? Naam. What is impossible for Allah Ta'ala and is obligatory for us to know? Number one, non-existence. Number two, multiplicity. Number three, origination. So al-adam, non-existence. So that negates al al wujud, right? So if 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 you have the attribute of non-existence, that would uh, contradict the attribute of al wujud existence, right? So it is uh, negated about Allah wa Taala, right? Now, number two, multiplicity. At taaddud would negate the attribute of al wahdaniya. Hence, it is uh, uh, negated about Allah wa Taala. Number three, origination. Well, if you having a beginning would negate the attribute of al qidam. It would contradict it. When I say negate, it means if it was if someone was attributed with having a beginning, it would negate the fact that they have no beginning. So it is impossible to attribute that to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. It would contradict an obligatory attribute, and all of them are like that, now. Number four, termination. Well, intihabu, and coming to an end, right? al mm. Number five, resemblance. Right, to mushabahatu uh, ghayri, to resemble other than him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not like any of his creation. Number six, need. Number six. To be in need of anyone in itself or attributes in the actions or is not befitting to Allah wa Number seven, inability. The lack of ability to do something. Mm. Number eight, being compelled or lacking volition. So Allah is not uh, uh, compelled or forced to do anything. Fa'alun lima yurid. Mm. Number nine, ignorance. Number As ten. No. Number ten, deafness. As some, yes. Number eleven, blindness. Well, I'm a... Number twelve, death. Well, mm. And number thirteen, muteness. In As the well. meaning, in the meaning of negating the attribute of beginningless speech that is without language and sound from him. No. So here. There's another thing among al wahhabiya They say that Allah speaks biharfin wasawt. And this contradicts the belief of Ahl sunnati wal jama'a that the kalam of Allah is azali, that it has no beginning. Because huruf wal aswat, they develop letters and sounds, they develop in succession. So if you say bismillah, the ba comes before the scene, the scene becomes for the mean, and so forth. So there is sequence. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is not attributed with development and sequence and change. Because the makharij and huruf, the exit points from words, they mean a change in one state, in one's movements, in one's articulation. And Allah Ta'ala is clear of any attribute of change. So when we say the, the kalam of Allah is expressed in letters, in words, but it's as an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is not letters in words. Mm. 
It is possible for Allah to Allah and required of us to know, and the rational mind and transmitted knowledge also indicated that. Oh, here I want whenever Al Sunnah, the Ashaira and Maturidiyah speak about the attributes of Allah, they're going to speak about it from Ma Dalla Alayhi Al Aqal Wa Naqal. What the What uh, the sound mind uh, indicates and what the transmitted text indicate, meaning the Quran and the Sunnah. Now, that it is permissible for Allah to Allah to bring anything that is rationally possible into existence or not to bring anything or not to bring it into existence. So when he says rationally possible, meaning that his thing is that is al jaizul aqli that which is an intellectual permissibility, that's all of the creation. Through, by way of the attribute of power, knowledge, will, and power, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings that thing from existence and takes it out of existence. Now, But Allah ta'ala most high does not bring into existence except what accords with that which, he is, which is already in his beginningless knowledge and his beginningless will, that it would enter into existence. So everything that exists, exists by the ilm, irada, and qudra of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. Naam. Thus Allah ta'ala most high brings a creature into existence in its time according to what he knows and wills without origination. Mm. General proof for the existence of Allah ta'ala and his attributes. So you have... Uh, a dalil al ijmali and a dalil al tafsili. You have a proof that is general, basic, and then you have one that is detailed. So when we talk about the existence of Allah and his attributes, it is a personal obligation that we know about this generally in a brief way, not in a detailed way. So, and that's why I mentioned to uh, you that some people they say all this Akita is advanced. No, this stuff is for, these matters that we're talking about are far ayn. You must know them. You don't have like it's not something that's detailed. It's something that you must know, right? It is obligatory beliefs about Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that you must know. And then there are details, but the details are much more uh, advanced. Nor and they're not obligatory on every mukallif, every morally responsible individual. But some things you must know in at least in a brief way. Now, a responsible individual is required to know that well, everyone got a mukallif. That is the responsible, morally responsible, accountable individual. Now, is required to know the general proof for the existence of Allah Taala Most High and His attributes in order to safeguard his belief. No. An example of it, i.e. general proof, is saying to himself, I came to be in my mother's womb after I did not exist. Mm. After what exists and what exists after not existing must have something that produces it, meaning a creator who produced and formed it. So there must be a creator who created my limbs and my parts and my internal and external details. That former who formed me and produced me is not my father, my mother, or any other creature. Rather, it is an immense creator. It created everything that exists in this cosmos, and it has complete control over each of its cosmos atoms. It is a singular deity without partner and peer. It is unblemished by any deficiency. It has absolute perfection without limitation. It must be described with possessing knowledge, ability, will, life, and all other attributes of perfection that fit the divine. The minds of created beings cannot have comprehensive knowledge of it. In Arabic, it is named Allah. Now, and that's a brief way. So in other way, even more brief than that, one can say that for every doing, there must be a doer. And that doer in Arabic is called Allah, right? For every action, there is one who caused that action to come into existence. And the one who caused all the actions to come into existence is Allah. Now, go ahead. Answer to whomever ask, what is Allah? Among what is important for a Muslim to know is how to answer someone who asks, what is Allah? This is a question many youngsters ask. 
yet many elders are not able to properly answer. It is possible to provide a valid answer by saying, Allah Ta'ala Most High exists. No other existence resembles him. Whatever you conceive of in your mind, Allah Ta'ala does not resemble it. And this is very important. When you're talking to your children, to train them from the beginning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not an object that they can imagine, right? That their mind cannot reach the reality of Allah. So he said, when you're talking to them, and even when you're talking to adults, because unfortunately sometimes as adults who didn't learn the proper creed, we have this you know, imaginary thing about everything, right? Everything must be physical and tangible for us to believe in it. So they mention Allah Ta'ala, Allah Ta'ala mawjudun la yushbihu ghayrahu min al-mawjudat. Right? فَمَغْمَا تَصَوَرْتَ bibalik فَاللَّهُ la yushbihu ذَلِكَ Right? So Allah exists and His existence doesn't resemble other things that exist. And whatever you imagine in your mind, Allah does not resemble that. And that should be a golden rule. I remember our teachers used to say to us, that's the golden rule. Whatever you imagine in your mind, Allah is different from that. And that is, in the Quran, a verse that will help you understand this. Allah mentioned, وَجَعَلَ ذُلُمَاتِ وَالنُّورِ وَجَعَلَ يَعْنِي خَلَقَ Allah created the darkness and the light. And I remember our teacher telling us this and it made it so clear to me to understand why we cannot imagine Allah. He said, we all know the absence of light is darkness, right? If there's no light, there's darkness, right? And the opposite of darkness is light. So we, we, we look at these two states. Either it's going to be darkness or light. If there's no light, that's darkness. If there's no darkness, that means it's light. But Allah told us, وَجَعَلَ الظُّلُمَاتِ nur. He created the darkness and light. So there was a period of time that there was no light and there was dark, no darkness because darkness and light are not the first creations. SubhanAllah. And we cannot imagine there being no light and no darkness. We can't imagine what that is like. So how do we imagine the one who created that state of existence before darkness and light? SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah, that's deep. So that's created things, the original water, al-arsh, uh, al-kursi, al-qalam, the throne, the chair, the pen, al the sacred tablet. Right? Hence, You cannot imagine created things. How do you imagine the creator of those things? Impossible. So hence, you understand whatever you imagine about Allah, Allah is different from that. Naam, go ahead. However, we should mention that we, based upon incontrovertible proofs, know some matters about Allah Ta'ala with certainty. Among them are... That the true reality of Allah Ta'ala Most High is not like the true reality of anything else. Allah Ta'ala Most High is not a member of the cosmos, i.e. the universe. No one knows the true reality of Allah Ta'ala other than He Most High. So you have two types of evidences or proofs in, 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 in uh, technical terminology in Islam. You have proofs that are what he called al adillatul al qat'iyya absolute definitive proofs that the mind cannot reject right the mind the sound mind accepts then you have al adillatul dhanniyya which are 
proofs that bear more than one possibility, right? One of those proofs that is a dalil qat'i, an absolute definitive certain proof, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his reality is not like the reality of anything else, right? And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not an element of the creation of the universe of the world. And no one knows the reality of Allah other than Allah. This is an absolute evidence of his divine oneness, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Naam. That Allah Ta'ala Most High is not in any location or direction since he does not possess a body, volume, or form. Here, وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى لَيْسَ فِي أَيِّ مَكَانٍ أَوْ جِهَةٍ لِأَنَّهُ لَيْسَ ذَا جِسْمٍ وَحَجْمٍ وَشَكٍ Right? So we don't ascribe to Allah since we cannot imagine his reality and he has the attribute of الْمُقَالِدْ فَاتُّ لِلْهَوَادِثِ Right? And all the Hawadith, right? Uh, all of the creative things, they exist within a Makan, within a Jiha, within a direction. They have a Jism, they have a Hajim, they have a Shakal, they have a body, they have a volume, they have a form. All the Hawadith, all the creative events, Jami'ul Makhluqat, all of them are like that. Wallahu subhanahu wa ta'ala la yushbihu al-makhluqat, makhluqat. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not resemble created things. So Allah mawjoodun bila makan, wala jiha, wala masafa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists without a place, a location, a direction, or a distance between him and his creation. Walaysa jisman. Allah is not a body. وَلَا جَوْهَرًا And he's not an attribute, uh, uh, a, a, a particle. وَلَا عرضا. And he is not a attribute of, of the particles. All of those are negated about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By the way, I ask one of you to give me evidence from the early scholars and a book who mentioned the statement, Laysa Kamithli Shay. Did y'all come up with that yet? I asked one person, but maybe some others helped. Did we? No? Sort of. <laughs> is the homework done? Ustad Farooq is questioning. Aina Dalilukum, where is your proof? <laughs> right? They don't speak English? Okay, tell them in Arabic. Allah Ta'ala laysa kamithli shay. Naam, Allah mentioned there is nothing that resembles him. But I ask, sa'altuka and kitab wal alam min, min al ulama fi al kurun al madia anna hum yakulun anna Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mawjudun bila makan. اذكر لي واحد واحد من العلماء الذين يقولون هذا القول وفي أي كتاب اكتب لنا كتابا ومؤلفا الذي قال أن الله موجود بلا مكان يعني العالم مشهور وكتاب مشهور اوكي okay, answer 
Help me out. That was for the homework, but I'll give you one because we mentioned in the past centuries, in the past generations, right? Uh, one is this book, Al Farqu Bain Al Firaq, right? Al Farqu Bain Al Firaq. I wanted to help, so give you an example. This book was written by the great Imam Abdul Qahir Ibn Tahir Ibn Muhammad Al Baghdadi. He died in the year 429. He mentioned in this book, right, issues that Ali Sunnati wal Jama'a have consensus on them in usul, in the tenets of faith. Among them, he mentions that. Ali Sunnah wa ajma'u ala annahu la yahwihi makan wa la yajri alayhi zaman. He said, Ali Sunnah, they have consensus that Allah is not contained in a place, nor is he subject to time. Right? And then he mentions two statements of Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib. This is in the book, Al Farqu Bain al Firaq published by Darul Ma'rifa on page 200 and, oops, 292, 292. Okay, on this page, 292. He mentions in that book, he mentions two statements of Ali. He said, وَقَدْ قَالَ الْأَمِيرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Ali radiyallahu anhu, he said, the commander of the faithful, Ali, he said, Inna Allah ta'ala qalaq al-arsha idhadim li qudratihi, la makanin li dhatihi. He said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah created, uh, la ilaha illallah, excuse me. He said, verily Allah ta'ala created the throne as an indication of his power and not to take it as a place for himself. وَقَالَ عَيْضًا And he also said, قَدْ كَانَ وَلَا مَكَانَ قَدْ كَانَ يَعْنِي Allah. Allah existed في الْأَزَلْ Eternally. وَلَا مَكَانَ And there was no place. وَهُوَ الْآنَ عَلَى مَا عَلَيْهِ كَانَ And he exists as he always exists. Meaning without a place. So there's one book. So this was in the 5th century. The great Imam Abdul Qad Abdul Qahir uh, Abu Mansur Al Baghdadi in his book Al Farq Bayna Fira, and he mentioned an issue of ijma of Al Sunnah that Allah Mawjudun Bila Makan. So go get me four more. I gave you the example. That's one. So no one will say you made it up. No, I didn't make it up. Here is Abu Mansur al-Baghdadi. Here is his book, Al-Farqu Bain al Here is the statement of Sayyidina Ali. Mm. Tayyip, are we we're done? No. Okay, go ahead. We have a little bit more to go. Go ahead. That Allah Ta'ala Most High is not in need of anything, is not harmed by anything, and is not befitted, befitted, I'm sorry, benefited by anything since he possesses absolute perfection. So Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, he has al-kamal al-mutlaq, absolute. Sahihun jazakumullahu khaira wa nafa'a bikum shaykhuna lastu shaykhan. Ana tilmidhan. I'm not a shaykh, just a student. Mm. Barakallahu bikum. May Allah reward you. Allah. Tayyip. So Allah is attributed with al-kamal mutlaq. Absolute. As for creation, they have al-kamal al-mukhayyid. It is restricted. It's not absolute. Right? It is relative. Where Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala, his kamal is mutlaq. Absolute. Allah is Mausufun bi kulli kamalin 
Yalikubi. He is attributed with every befitting proper perfection. Munazzahun and kulli naqsan fi haqqihi. And he is transcendent of every deficiency that could be attributed to him. Now, that Allah Ta'ala Most High has no beginning to his existence, so he has no creator. As for others, their existence does have a beginning, so they do need a creator. That mm -hmm. Allah Ta'ala Most High is the creator of everything other than him, i.e. everything in the world, including bodies, actions, and other things. There is no creator except him. That nothing is required of Allah Ta'ala Most High. No one holds any right over him, but he, Most High, his promise is true and his threat is true. Whatever apparent meaning of the noble verses of the Quran and the honorable hadiths might seem to be might seem to describe Allah Ta'ala Most High with one of the attributes of created beings like corporeality, place, motion, and stillness. Corporeality meaning being a body. Al Jistam. Mm. Their valid explanation is, with certainty, something else. Right. So he says, right, which is beautiful, that everything, that the apparent meaning that comes to your mind from the verses of the Quran or the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, that describe Allah with an attribute from among the attributes of the creation, the apparent, that's not the reality. But when you read it, what rushes to your mind is some attribute among the attributes of the creation, like a body or a place, a jism, al makan, al haraka, or movement, or sukun, or rest. Any of that, when you read a verse of the Quran and you read it, and the apparent meaning comes to you, some attribute as an attribute of the creation, like a body, like a form, like a direction, like being in a place movement or rest know that the explanation of that the tafsir of that is other than what you imagine absolutely is this clear tayyib al-bayhaqi mentioned it also in his book al-asma wa sifat where at in al-asma is sifat Abu Asiya, Yahya, Jomo Williams, Muhammad, you said that Al Bayhaqi mentioned it. Where in his book Al Asma is uh, was Sifat, and what is the statement? You are correct. Just where? You are correct. You are correct. Al Bayhaqi did mention it. Now where? And what did he say? And when did Al Bayhaqi live? Okay, tomorrow. Barakallahu bikum. We we just now we're gonna share. That's all. We'll keep sharing and sharing and sharing. Bring the original book if you can. Don't copy and paste. If you bring the original book and the page and which which publication, it makes much easier. Right? So you will mention, for instance, in this book, Bayhaqi, published by such and such, paid such and such, and his statement is such and such. This is so people can find it. They won't think you're perverting. That's why I show books. So no one say you made it up. Here's the book. Right? But I know you can't show, but you can tell the page, the publication, where you took it from, right? And we should get into that habit. It takes time, but it, it's very helpful. Imam Abu Mansur al-Baghdadi, he was the Imam of Baghdad of Ali Sunnah in his time. Uh, well known for his uh, defending the creed of Ahl Sunnah in Baghdad against Al Mujassima and Mushabbiya. So he was in Baghdad during the time of those Mushabbiya and Mujassima among the Hanabila. He was in that time. 
and he was among the foremost scholars of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'a to explain the creed and refute those ideas. And his books are among the most famous books on identifying the sects that existed in that time in Islam. This book is no one who studies that subject about Islamic sects would not read this book, Al Farq Bain al Firaq. It is by far the most famous book on that subject. And I'm waiting. For years, our teachers used to tell us he has a book called Tafsir al Asma wa Sifat, like Kitab al Asma wa Sifat. It is now published, and I'm waiting to get my hands on it. So those who uh, those who read Arabic, it's a, a beautiful, amazing book, and they just published it from the manuscripts. So uh, inshallah, I'm waiting for mines to be sent to me, uh, and I'm going to share it with you. It is three volumes in one edition, and there is another edition coming out, I think maybe two or three volumes by another editor who's very good at editing books. So inshallah, that is something that for years we heard our teachers mention quotes from that book, but they were in manuscripts. So inshallah, well, I'm going to add that to the libraries and don't get mad, more books. <laughs> Stop. That's a joke. Alhamdulillah. Would the Wahhabis accept him when they want, depend what they want to use him for? Now, inshallah, let us, where we at? Did we stop? Where did we stop at? Yes. Page 15 at the top. Okay, let's stop there. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Sometimes I may have slip of the tongue. So pay attention. If something sounds strange to you, it may have been that I had the slip of the tongue. So ask me about it or make bring it to my attention. Okay. Uh, they got the Arabic. Allahumma alamna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima alamtana wa zidna ilma ya rabbal alameen. Okay. MashaAllah. Ameen. Ameen ya rabb. Bijahin nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam nas'alaka. Okay. Nah. At tafsir al-labur. Your, your spell check, Farooq, you have to Correct it. Look at it before you say sin, because it's not coming out clear at all. So when you, it's changing your words all up, it does that a lot. Your spell check. So let me see if I can answer any questions that we have or clarifications. I, I, I got a, I don't forgot, I got a meeting. So I only can pick a few questions. I have to go. I'm sorry. Um, We got anything? No? Please, everyone, press share now. We have much more people. So please, everyone, make the intention to spread beneficial knowledge and share. Barakallahu fikum, jazakumallahu khaira. We're making a lot of progress. And with your help, we can continue and we can reach more people. We have a lot of work to do. So I'm watching the results and, and mashallah, we're, we're, we're accomplishing a lot of goodness. May Allah continue to allow us to be successful. The burning bush, that, uh, is not a place where Allah speaks. The tree did not become, or the bush does not become Allah. In other words, this is a location that Allah allowed Moses to hear his kalam, but it's not coming from the tree. And, and there are more details in that explanation. Uh, inshallah, I'll give them to you later. There are different ways that the scholars explain that. 
but let me double uh, confirm some ones where I can point to you, inshallah. No, it's not tafsir. It is it's explaining the names and attributes of Allah. It's not a book of tafsir like Quranic commentary. It's a book of explaining the names of Allah and their meanings. The names and attributes of Allah. Yeah, Fakhruddin al-Razi has many books on which he says Allah exists without a place. Many books. In fact, mostly all of his books. Mm. Allah some people confuse the 13 attributes to be an AICP thing. Can you speak a little on its origin? The 13 attributes were mentioned by many of the great scholars, even Imam al nawawi and scholars before that, since the time of Imam al-Ashari, as he uh, clarified in a, format, uh, a systematic way of describing and mention about Allah and what is obligatory believer, the Ashaida and the Maturidiyah, those scholars who came after them, they put these attributes in a simplistic way so that the common person would know what is obligatory to believe of Allah. So you can go way before the AICP even existed. The AICP was established really as its growth in 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 the in the in the I think seventies or something like that, right? Not that far, right? As a established organization, right? Uh, but before that, all of the scholars of Lebanon, of Sham, of Egypt have mentioned uh, the attributes of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. This in the book Al Maqasid of Imam Al Nawawi, you will see it. The scholars of Hadramaut, you will see it. Uh, all of this is the belief of the Ashaira. It's not specific to the AICP at all. And I'll show you multiple scholars in the past. You read Al Aqid al Sunni Siyah, you're going to see those attributes. So that's not an AICP thing. Al Insaf, being fair, would not, you won't try to say people made something up that they didn't make. I'm not saying you saying that, but that's a false. Uh, that's a false idea. All of Ahl Sunnah mention these attributes. Hmm. That's a Philly thing, Farouk. You're not from Philly, so you wouldn't understand it. It's a Philly thing. You wouldn't understand. <laughs> now, let me stop. <laughs> I'm gonna make sure I'm gonna call you today, I promise, inshallah ta'ala. Um, here, may Allah reward you, Brother Ali. We uh, appreciate your support. Uh, no, honestly, be fair, right? Everyone, as I mentioned to you, be fair. Everyone has good things and bad things. Everybody. Everybody has good qualities and stuff they need to work on. Every group, every organization, every sheikh, no matter who you are, you're a human being. You're not Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's going to be good things in you. There's going to be bad things. Everybody. No one's free of that. Right? So, every organization, 
They got some good things and they got some bad things, right? So fairness is you mention the good things about people and you mention the bad things about people, right? And you are fair. If it's a bad thing, you mention it as a bad thing and you don't go above it. If it is a good thing, you mention it as a good thing and you praise the person for that. Because a person got bad, that doesn't mean they, they don't have anything good. And because they got good, that doesn't mean they have anything bad. You gotta be fair. So when people talk about the AICP, they make it as if because of the way they are in their approach, they make it like everything they're saying is bad. No, maybe they could be softer. Maybe they could have a different uh, approach in different things. But that doesn't mean that everything they're saying is not correct. They are saying many correct things that are the belief of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah, right? So you can't negate it because of a group. And that goes with any group. That's not just specifically pointing to them, you know? We got to be fair with whatever we're dealing with. Even when we deal with those who we disagree with, we disagree with the Wahhabiyyah. It doesn't mean everything they did was bad, right? They did good things and they did bad things. The bad things, I'll give you an example. If it wasn't for the Wahhabi movement, most of us would not be engaged in learning about Hadith. Most of us would not be engaged in learning the Aqidah of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. It is because of that fitna that push many people to learn al ulum al hadithiyya learning the islamic uh, the hadith sciences in al aqaid al islamiyya learning the beliefs of islam and the creed of ahl sunnah and the ashaira and ma turida if it wasn't for the wahhabis they wouldn't many people wouldn't even be talking about these issues so through them through that fitna it revived the learning of Hadith and the learning of the creed. So a good came out of it for Ahl Sunnah, even though it was a bad thing from them and their deviation. But they are responsible for that movement, no doubt. That's why I said it's still a Philly thing, Farouk. You're not from Philly. <laughs> nah, I'm having fun with you. MashaAllah. So don't make it about groups. Forget groups. We can't join no group. Seriously. Black people can't afford to join no group. We can't. We need to form our own group and work with other groups. All right? I'm going to repeat that. Black folk, American, that was born here, the so-called Negro can't afford to join nobody else's group. We have to form our own groups and cooperate with other groups. We can't join nobody. Why? Because no one has our best interests at hand. Every time we join someone's group, we get the short end of the stick. We spend years, we spend decades building someone else's agenda, and we stuck. We have to stop that. Straight up, one of my teachers, and I respect him, he was my teacher. He asked me to join his group. I said, much as I love you, we have our own group that we have to establish. He looked at me like, you're my student. And I looked at him like, you're my teacher, but I gotta take care of my children for tomorrow. At the end of the day, I got babies. And I got people with babies, right? Listen, this is serious. Your babies, you're going to take care of them. You're not going to be concerned about my, ba my babies. So I ain't got nothing against you, but I got to take care of my babies. And I'm a man. I'm not your boy. My children deserve the best, just like your children. My children deserve the knowledge of the religion, just like your children. 
My children deserve higher education, just like your children. My children need to have community and schools and business and well-being, just like your children. And I can't count on you to do it. I got to do that. If you get my point, right? And he looked at me. He knows I'm soft, so he backed up. <laughs> right? He's like, uh-oh, I just made him angry. No, I said, listen, out of respect, but that's a blameworthy thing that all you think black folk can do is serve. No, we know how to lead too. And we know how to be men and women and take care of our families. We can't afford to join your group. That doesn't mean we're against you, but we have to be for ourselves because you're not going to make sure you're not going in the hood where they're killing babies, where they're doing drive-bys. Just the other day, four people got shot in my city, four youth. Two of them got killed, innocent bystanders. Are you going to go in there and work with those kids and help those families? No, I got to do that. So don't tell me to join your group unless you're willing to put in some of this work. Other than that, barakallahu fikum, jazakumullah khaira. I help support whatever is good, but I got work to do. And stop treating me like I'm a kid. I'm not. I'm an adult and I'm a responsible adult. He got my point, right? And we all got to feel that way because our babies are being decimated in this society. And who's going to save them if we don't do it? We got work to do, seriously. And I'm way over time. But no, we, we, we got to take that stuff serious, right? Or are you going to say, oh, man, they're animals? You won't say it in words, but that's your state. Lisan al hal your state is saying, are they animals? Forget them Negroes. Now nah, I can't forget them. I'm from them. I'm from them. That's my people. That's my people. Now, nah, we got to figure it out. And I know we, we've, we've become a people who believe that we got to be a slave. They put us in slavery so long that we believe that that's our permanent status, servant of others. Man, I know some stuff. I watch, I'm gonna share a story with you. I won't mention names, but I'm gonna share a story with you. We have brothers that I know. They studied, they learned, they went overseas. They graduated from Islamic universities, from schools. They speak Arabic. They study books. And they came back to their own neighborhoods, their own city, and their own people. And they were under the control of other than their people, immigrants. And they would, this is persons who learned. They could write books. They graduated from university, smart, intelligent. And they used to tell them, you can't do this without permission. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do this. Where the hell you go to school for? And I told the person that. He's like, man, you're gonna get me in trouble. I'm not gonna get you in trouble, man up. Why did you go learn? Why did you become a sheikh? To do nothing? To not change the condition of your people? And then, if you write, you get in trouble. But they write books all the time. But you don't write. And they write books that don't apply to your people. But you can't write nothing for your people. This is wrong. But that's how they'll treat a Negro if you let them. Not everybody, but this is real stuff. I watch. Ah, man, don't get me started. Seriously. That stuff irritates me because that's not our religion. That's not the way the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was. Our deen is empowering and uplifting everybody, not a selective few over other people.
No, we are equal in terms of uh, having the ability to lead and to be successful and to build communities. And all of us need these things. Now we got work to do, seriously. So when I'm asking you about these matters and support each other, you got to stick together. And that doesn't mean you exclude anyone. That means you're willing to cooperate with others, but you have to empower yourselves. You have to. And that's not haram. That's obligatory for you to build your people. The Prophet was Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when somebody would come to him, he would teach him and he said, go back and warn your people. Go back and teach your people. That's the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's in many hadith. He didn't let people come stay in Medina. Go back and teach your people. And people were bringing whole tribes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Whole tribes of people were coming and accepting Islam because one of their members went and learned. How do you think the Prophet got to Al Medina Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? People from Medina went to Mecca. They learned from the Prophet. They went back to Medina. They taught more people. And then before the Prophet got to Medina, the people of Medina had embraced Islam. They weren't the same as the people in Mecca. They weren't the same from the tribe of Quraysh. They were different tribes with different ideas and different thoughts and different cultures. And they all taught and built one another. We got to take the same thing. We got to do the same thing. And, but it takes men and black men. We got we to gotta man up. Our women are already like that. It's our men that don't take the lead that needs to be taken. And I'm getting ready to get on the... This stuff irritates me, really, because we have a lot of work to do. And we, if we ever... I was watching something yesterday. I, I got to take a few minutes. I was watching, I watch a lot of Arab TV and a lot of Arab shows, like Arabic shows, programs in Arabic. And I was watching an organization overseas that I follow their works a lot, right? Because I like their work, they build. They was having a gathering talking about how to use modern technology to give da'wah. And I actually was in that country and their technology is horrible, right? But they're talking about how to use technology to spread Dawa and spread their message, and, and which is a beautiful thing. And they got students that they sent to the West who came over here, went to school, learned media, learned all that stuff, and then they took it back to their country and their building. And they're talking about Facebook and, and uh, Instagram and WhatsApp and all these Telegram and all this other stuff and how they should use it. And they got the shakes and how they're going to use it and how to work it. And, and I'm thinking, we're right here where all this stuff is developed and we're not using it to build our communities properly. We can get the stuff that they trying to get at the top level for free, but we're not engaging like we should. We got our kids that go to school and learn all this stuff just as a part of it, but we don't even got our youth connected to the message, connected to our organizations to maximize that stuff. So we go over there to follow someone who's trying to follow what we got already. That doesn't make sense. We should go contributing, not just borrowing. You should learn and you should use the resources you got to build. So we got work, brothers and sisters. We got a lot of work. And one of the problems we got, we got to stop having hatred and enmity towards one another. We got to believe in us as a people, right? We got to love ourselves. That doesn't mean you hate nobody else. You love all Muslims. You love all the people of La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. But you gotta 
Take care of your people. You have to. And you'll get more respect when you're independent. When you're able to not have your hand out, you're able to build, you're going to get more respect. Right? You're going to get more respect. So we got to do our part. Inshallah. May Allah make it easy. For us. Oh man, that's too personal, Ten Weir. La Hola Wala. Inshallah. May Allah make it easy. We, we, we got it. One more story. Imam Fahim Lee, we're begging him to put a fundraiser together for Kuba Institute so we can support him and we can make his community successful because it's in the heart of Camden and Camden needs da'wah. Camden needs resources. Camden needs Imam Fahim to be successful and we need to help Imam Fahim be successful. It is extremely important. So that's my last story. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad. I, I, I love you all. Please make dua for me. I make dua for you. And let's continue the work. And one of the things we're going to do, as soon as this pandemic release a little bit, we're coming to different cities. And we're going to work on the ground together to build. Because we need to build all of us simultaneously to the best we can, right? Not just one masjid, all of our masjids in the inner cities around, we need to build. And trust me, when we start doing it, others are gonna cooperate. But no one's going to work with someone who's lazy. So let us pick it up. No, that's cool, uh, don't worry about it, Tenway, I understand. I know the pain, trust me, I understand. I don't know, you gotta, I tell you, uh, uh, Bashir, you gotta help me with that. I, I, my, 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 my Ebonics is gonna always kick in, so just remind me, I, I'm, I'm humble. So instead of using have, instead of got, got you. <laughs> have you, no, nah, let me stop. All right, I, I understand what you're saying. I'll work on it. Barakallahu fikum, may Allah reward you. All right. Bisir al-Asr al-Fatiha. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Inshallah, we'll see you. Today is Wednesday? Tomorrow, inshallah. Tomorrow morning. Barakallahu fikum.